Hey guys, I got a little oxygen therapy review for you set up here. Want to run through it real, real quick with you, especially with with finals on the cusp. Uh, some things that you need to remember. Now, when you talk about oxygen therapy, it breaks down into what seems like a big topic. But if you'll simplify it, it's really not that overwhelming. Okay, it basically breaks down like this. When you talk about oxygen therapy, the question is, is what's the indication for implementing oxygen therapy? And there's only three of them. And so I'm going to list them up here for you. Okay, the first one is to treat documented Hypoxemia. This is a patient that presents with hypoxemia. It's documented. Now, what do you mean by documented, Joe? I mean this. Either you have a blood gas that reveals an arterial oxygenation level less than 80 millimeters of mercury, or you have an oxygen saturation less than 90%. That's documented hypoxemia. Now, the second indication is to treat... The signs and symptoms of chronic hypoxemia. I'm running out of room, but y'all get my message, right? To treat the signs and symptoms of chronic hypoxemia. This is your COPD or who lives at an oxygen saturation of 89%. When are you going to put them on oxygen? when they present with signs and symptoms associated with chronic hypoxemia. So shortness of breath, um, tachypnea, tachycardia, things like that. Okay, and then the last indication is to decrease to decrease the cardiopulmonary workload. Now, what is cardiopulmonary workload? That means you have tachypnea present, you have tachypnea present, you have tachycardia present, you have an increased cardiopulmonary workload. Cardio meaning heart, pulmonary meaning lungs. The patient is working hard to breathe and to perfuse, and you're going to give oxygen to reduce that workload. Now, when it comes down from that, you have to ask yourself, what device am I going to put them on? And this falls into two categories. Am I going to go a low flow device? Or am I going to go a high flow device? Okay, now you got to know your low flow and your high flow devices. Your low flow devices are simple. They're your nasal cannulas, your simple mask, And your non rebreathers, just to, main, just to name the most common. Your high flows are going to be your, air, your vent, Venturi devices. Such as your Venturi mask or your aerosol devices such as a trait collar. Okay, or a face tint or an aerosol mask. Now, you got to know your rules that come with these devices. So I'm just going to simply leave it like this. First of all, low flow versus a high flow. What does it mean? Remember, a low flow device does not deliver a precise FiO2. So you're guessing at how much you're actually giving. A high flow device actually exceeds the patient's inspiratory flow and delivers a precise FiO2. So you can put somebody on a simple mask and you can deliver 40 to 60 percent but you don't really know how much you're delivering or you can put somebody on a Venturi mask and know exactly that you're delivering 50 percent. Why? Because the Venturi mask exceeds the patient's inspiratory flow. Some may say inspiratory demand. The simple mask does not exceed the patient's inspiratory flow or inspiratory demand. So that's the first thing you got to know. Low flow does not deliver a, a precise FiO2. High flow does deliver a high 
a, a, a precise FiO2. Low flow does not exceed the patient's inspiratory demand. High flow does exceed the patient's inspiratory demand. We good? All right. Now, when we talk about low flow devices, we talk about a nasal cannula. A nasal cannula, the max is what? That's right. The max is six liters per minute. It has to stay less than six liters per minute. If you have to go greater than six liters per minute, guess what? You got to go to a new device. When we talk about a simple mask, the simple mask doesn't have a max. It has a minimum. And it has a minimum because when you put a mask on somebody, you have to flush out carbon dioxide. And if you don't, then the patient can rebreathe that carbon dioxide and go into respiratory failure. So the simple mask has a minimum. So the simple mask has to be set at greater than what? That's right, five liters per minute. Okay, now when we talk about a non rebreather, a non rebreather is kind of one of these. Topics that falls into a category of low flow devices as categorized by Egan's, but some people call it a high flow device. I don't really care. All you know is that a high flow, I mean a non rebreather, delivers roughly 80% oxygen. If you ever find yourself in an emergency situation and you don't know what to do, put your patient on a non rebreather, especially if they're cyanotic, their lips are blue, their sats are 77%. It's an emergency. Put them on a non-rebreather until you can figure out something else to do. Okay? But what's the key about a non-rebreather? Understanding proper, proper function of a non-rebreather, right? So nasal cannula, keep it less than 6 liters per minute. Simple mass, keep it greater than 5 liters per minute. A non-rebreather, what do we do? That's, that's right. Keep the bag inflated. Now, that's not completely entirely true. Okay? Normal functioning of a non rebreather is that on inspiration, the bag deflates partially, on exhalation, it reinflates fully. On inspiration, it deflates partially. Now, so the question is this. I'm going to give you a couple questions here. You're taking care of a patient. They're on a non-rebreather. And upon inspiration, the bag fully collapses. What are you going to do? The answer is, because the bag is fully collapsing, increase the flow to the bag. But what if the question says you're administering oxygen to a patient via non-rebreather and upon inspiration, the bag partially deflates? What's the appropriate measures? The answer is nothing. That's the way it's supposed to work. So the bag should stay inflated if it collapses partially on inspiration, thumbs up. If it fully collapses, increase the flow. Okay, everybody good there? All right, so now we're gonna to go to Venturi devices. These devices, the flow is based off of the FiO2 that you set and your goal is to exceed the patient's inspiratory demand flow. If you're dealing with aerosol devices and the aerosol completely disappears on inspiration, what should you do? Increase the flow. Because if the aerosol is completely disappearing, then the patient is in training room air and they're diminishing the FiO2 delivered. If the aerosol diminishes but doesn't completely diminish, then that's okay. All right? So, so don't panic about that. Just know that if the aerosol completely disappears, your flow is not high enough, okay? Now this brings us to our final hazard, our final, not a final hazard, but our final point on oxygen therapy, which brings us to our hazards. 
And that is understanding uh, situations that oxygen is now causing a problem. So the first one is... Oxygen toxicity. Oxygen toxicity leads to the increase in free radicals and can actually destroy lung tissue and lead us to a state of, of um, in, uh, restrictive lung disease, ARDS, things like that. So uh, oxygen toxicity is too much oxygen that causes an increase in free radicals. Got a problem. If, you, if the question talks to you about increasing free radicals, what's the hazard? It's oxygen toxicity. You need to decrease the oxygen. Okay, you're over oxygenating your patient. The second one is I'm just going to put ROP. ROP stands for retinopathy of prematurity. So now we're talking about our premature neonatal babies, and you do not want to give them too much oxygen. Okay, too much oxygen to a premature baby can lead to blindness well, we don't want that so remember rop retinopathy of prematurity that's bad turn your oxygen down the third one here is absorption atelectasis if you put too much oxygen into a patient let, let, let me say it medically. If you administer too high of an FiO2 to, to a patient, then you can essentially flush out their lungs, their alveoli of required or, or essential nitrogen, and that can lead to atelectasis. And we don't want that, okay? Think about it. We all breathe 21% oxygen, 79%, roughly 79% nitrogen, and and that nitrogen helps to keep our alveoli open. If you flush all the nitrogen out and you put all oxygen in, then all of the oxygen absorbs into the blood and nothing is left to keep this, the alveoli open and they collapse, causing atelectasis. So absorption atelectasis, be aware of that. And then finally, we're talking about... Depression of ventilation. And when we talk about depression of ventilation, we're talking about our CO2 retainers, our COPDers, whose, whose drive to breathe has switched from the drive to get CO2 out to the drive to get oxygen in. So if you give this patient too much oxygen, then they will essentially stop breathing. They will slow way down. Their respiratory rate will go from 20 to 4. And they'll, stop, they'll, they'll, they'll literally slow their minute ventilation. Their, their drive to breathe will, will slow. And they'll think to themselves subconsciously, obviously, I don't need to breathe because I have so much oxygen inside of me. And I don't breathe on getting rid of CO2 anymore. I breathe on getting oxygen in. And because I have so much... I don't need to breathe. And they'll literally slow down to the point to where they'll literally breathe two, three, four times a minute. When that happens, they'll become hypoxemic. They'll become acidotic because the CO2 will rise too high. They don't care. They don't know. Their body doesn't work like that anymore. And they'll slowly try to die. That's oxygen therapy 101. Indications, knowing your devices, Knowing your hazards, being safe when you have to administer oxygen. Good luck on your finals next week, guys.